Um, so I want to kind of start off uh, a, a, a little antidote about um, a lesson I learned a long time ago. Um, it's apropos to what we're going to be talking about today. So back, I, I actually kind of got accidentally thrust into enterprise web development in the tech bubble of the 90s. Um, and what's interesting is I found myself actually working, working for banks doing um, customer self-help type websites and uh, telephony, but found myself like in these rooms suddenly with all of these consultants from um, Capgemini, IBM, uh, back then was Anderson Consulting, um, you know, it's now Accenture and people like that. And we were kind of figuring out how are we building the first websites. And what's cool is it was the heady days of the 90s and we had big budgets for doing prototypes. So we could prototype out our websites, give people tasks to do things, videotape what they were doing to figure out like maybe what's the best way to build interfaces. Um, and so then we launched these websites, but I always kind of felt like, well, we weren't really getting feedback on how people were interacting with these websites. And in particular, were people getting confused? Because most software at that time were built for power users, for people you could train, not for a common person just to come to a website um, and be able to you know, move their funds around or move their, you know, move their 401ks uh, uh, around to different things. And so I wanted to kind of, so I started creating some little analytic systems to help me measure where, you know, what was going on with, the, with, the, um, with people on the websites. And what's interesting is, you know, I was just a developer, um, normally pretty quiet in a lot of these meetings, and then suddenly I started going to these meetings and I'd bring some of this data with me and say, hey, you know, I think here's a place that maybe we've got some usability issues, maybe we can tighten up some of our warning messages because people might be getting confused because we're seeing too many form submissions that aren't right, little things like that. And what was interesting is, I'm not a salesperson, and suddenly we're getting all these new budgets to make all these new fixes to things. Um, not a usability person, but suddenly I was getting called on in all these meetings about um, either A, did I have any information about you know, what we're seeing on the website, or B, could I create some of that information so that we'd understand better what's going on. And what I kind of found was that I actually went from being a developer after a year to being really more of a strategic partner. With a, with a lot of clients, even though I really had no background in it and didn't even really intend to do it, simply because I had good data and made common sense sort of, uh, common sense sort of um, assumptions about what, or theories about what we could do with that data. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today, is how can you guys, it's, and what I find interesting is that in today's world when we build websites, it's a lot of heuristics. It's a lot of people who you know, know, go to all these conferences and learn all these best practices and stuff like that. There's not much data that people are using. And I find that you'll learn some really interesting things when you start to weave more what I call results-oriented data into, um, you know, into your projects. So um, I kind of like to model out uh, a successful website, what I call a results-oriented website. It's one that you know, is designed to attract and then it engages, sort of builds trust until, we can, until it can convert. Converting is a thing that the stakeholders want to happen. Um, and, you know, a lot, and of course, there's a lot of websites that are built this way. What we're really talking about today is, how do we build these websites even better? Um, so the tricky part is that you've got something like Google Analytics. Actually, I want to go back to that slide. So one great way to get data is Google Analytics. The tricky part about it is if you just install Google Analytics, you're going to get some decent data about how well a website's attracting people or how many people are coming to the website. But you really don't get much good information about conversion, really no, no information out of the box about conversion, and very little information about really engagement. You get a little information about maybe time on site and stuff like that, which can be even misleading. High time on site can mean you actually have bad usability on the website because people aren't finding things. But there are ways to, um, to extend Google Analytics to get to those types of numbers that stakeholders really want. The tricky part, and this is not a hole in Google Analytics at all, the problem is, is that they basically, out of the box, you get everything that sort of like every website would want. And it's, you know, 200 different data points, you know, it's, it's an incredible amount of data. But ultimately, when we look at conversions, different types of websites want to track different kinds of things. And so it has to be cut, custom set up. So they've given us a tool to do this, but we still have got to kind of implement it and kind of come up with a plan for it. And so the first step in, um, in, in tracking the success of a website is to come up with what we call a measurement plan. And so a measurement plan basically says, what are the objectives of the business and how can we measure them? And ideally, can we put them into Google Analytics? Um, I'm going to kind of use that as a single tool. A lot of times they might, the data might be in some different types of analytic systems, but for now I like to just kind of put everything into one system. Um, and so we want to figure out like what are the types of things, like form submissions, maybe clicking on special types of links. 
um, what's measurable and what can we push forward. Some things get trickier, like tracking phone calls. Normally, you've got to bring in a third-party system you know, to help with those kinds of things. But we want to develop this measurement plan. And once we understand what kind of objectives um, we should be measuring for the success of, our, of our, our websites and our efforts, we can put it into Google Analytics using something called the goal system. And so the way goals work is when you first install Google Analytics, there's no goals in the, in the site, but you can go and configure them. So like say you want to track a form submission. Um, you can go in and you just give uh, a goal a name, you go into the Google admin, you give it a name, something like um, sales, sales submission, maybe it's a, you know, a sales demo request or something like that. And normally what you could, you could an easy, a pattern that's pretty popular is when someone submits the form, it goes to a thank you page and you set up a URL and you say, okay, whenever someone hits this URL, trigger this goal. Um, and so now every time someone submits the form, the goal is triggered. Um, the other thing that's really kind of interesting is that, uh, or just to note, is that goals will only count once per session, each, each goal, so different forms. So, and that's actually kind of good because like if someone, say, hits the back button and hits that thank you page again, we don't want the goal to trigger again. You know, or if someone submits the form again, it's not like they really we got any more benefit out of a second time they did it. So in general, it's, a good, it's good behavior that they only trigger once per session. Um, and when I say a session, you know, basically the way Google, Google Analytics uh, you know, tracks all these hits that happen on a website and it groups them together in a session. So when someone first hits the website, that's the start of a session. And basically it, it collects everything someone does um, until there's a, a, by default, a 30 minute, nothing happens. And then it says, okay, we're sh shutting out this session and everything that happened during that time, that's now um, as a part of our session. You can change it from 30 minutes, but generally most people just leave the default. One of the things that's pretty interesting about goals is you can pass a value. Um, and Google Analytics tr um, tracks its value, uh, or interprets its value kind of interestingly. They interpret it sort of like as a currency. Because um, they're basically trying to, try to encourage you to say, what is the value of this thing happening in business terms? I sometimes like to use the term utility, because some people kind of get hung up that I don't know exactly what a lead's worth, or I don't know exactly what you know, certain things are worth. Um, but it is sort of meant that it's something we want to drive towards. And so um, I kind of look at it as like level one analytics is just installing Google Analytics. Level two, and it's a big jump, is you know, getting your goals going. So you, know, you might very well have a lead generation website and you're tracking um, form submissions and maybe you're tracking phone calls. But in reality, phone calls are maybe only half as effective um, at generating sales as, say, a, as a form might be. That's where that value can come into play. So instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, we want to understand, say, what blog posts are you know, just doing the most conversions, we can weight them. So we might say, okay, well, our form um, is worth 100, and since we get half the conversion from phone calls, we're going to make that worth 50. Um, and ideally, what I like to do is you can think of it as just a way to weight and just kind of have like a random, you know, just kind of like an a, uh, abstract set of units. But ideally, I like to try to, if you can, bring it back to what's the value to the organization. You know, and sometimes if you're doing leads, you might very well say, well, you know, every lead we get is worth this. You know, the customer's worth this. And um, we convert one in four, and you can kind of like work the math back. Depends on what you're, you know, depends on what, your goal, what you're tracking as far as how you might want to do it. Um, and it can be tricky, but I encourage it. It's a good exercise just to do it. Um, and what I find is this is an area where people, people find it a little tricky doing this. Um, but what, you know, because as humans, we want very accurate numbers. And a lot of times it's hard. We've got to make a lot of assumptions on how we're going to value our goals. But, you know, what I like to say is it's much better to have a fuzzy number around something meaningful. You know, sort of the old adage of the person looking for their lost keys where there's bright light instead of where they actually lost them. Um, you know, just because you, 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 there's bright light around accuracy, we really want, we just want to um, have some good, a good estimate. Um, and we can always iterate on it later. So the, the stakeholders, they're going to love knowing these numbers, um, these ROI-oriented num numbers around these big macro conversions happening. But the people who work on the websites, the UX people, the marketers, the people generating content, those kinds of people, a lot of times they want to track other things. They call micro conversions. Um, actually, I shouldn't say I, Google. If you go through some of the Google training, they'll talk about the same thing. Um, and so, um, and what you know, a lot of times micro conversions are is they might be showing progression towards a conversion, um, or they might be something that provides value in a different way. So, you know, a lot of times if you're doing a good job in content marketing, um, you might become an authority, and if people aren't necessarily going to buy from you, but are champions of your brand, sharing your content. And so, someone doing a social share might provide value. It's not necessarily directly related to an end goal. 
um, but it still provides value. And so a lot of times it's good to set these things up as what I call micro-conversions. The tricky part about micro-conversions is that goals are not normally the best way to track them. Um, we only have about 20 of them. So like, let's say we were going to track social shares. And you were to try to track, oh, I want a social share on Twitter, on Facebook, and whatever. You can run out of these goals pretty quickly. Um, the other thing is they're only counted once per session. And so there is another way that we can count these things using a, another subsystem in Google Analytics called events. And so events um, actually are a lot more sophisticated than goals. Um, we can actually kind of attach three different levels of data. Um, instead of just a name, we basically have like a category, an action, and a label. We have a value, just like we do with goals. Um, and we can also um, add extra data to these using custom dimensions. I won't get too much into it, but because um, it's a little advanced, but it's something we can do. And we basically have an unlimited number of these things. Um, we don't even need to set them up in Google Analytics like we do goals. We just, we just use JavaScript to push them over. You use Tag Manager, just do JavaScript on your website to do those kinds of things. And so you know, what, what I like to do is let's track every meaningful interaction on the website as, a, as an event. So you know, how far people scroll down pages, how pe far people scroll through videos. Um, you know, if they click on CTAs, click on so, you know, go to a social profile, you know, those different types of things, want to set those up and track. They do have to cus be custom done. Um, there are no events right out of the box in Google Analytics. You have, to, you have to implement them custom. And so what I like to do is, you know, I could say is level, kind of that, that level two analytics, you've got your goals all set up and you've got them valued. But a level three is now taking your micro conversions and scoring those also to kind of give some fine detail that the UX people and other people working on the website are a lot of times interested in. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times I even sometimes will like to score um, some traffic metrics. Um, and then I normally do tr score engagement um, and, you know, sort of trust building as events. And then our big macro goals as, um, as conversions. So there's a little bit of a hack that um, I figured out a few years ago. The one tricky part is that events don't actually, the value doesn't track the same way um, value does in a goal, and I want them to. Like for if, say, someone shares in social and I associate 10 with it, I want it to be kind of considered like utility value. And so actually kind of a simple hack to do this is make, track everything you can with events, and I like to use a convention of putting a plus if it is meant to trigger a goal. And I put an explanation point if that value is meant to be interpreted as utility. And this gets a little advanced. Some of this, so you know, there's some things that are kind of on the, on the uh, more beginner side. There's some things on the more advanced side. So don't worry if you don't get all of it. Um, the, you know, the video will be up, and you can kind of come back and look at some of these more advanced things later. Um, but this is a little bit of, you know, I think, a, a great way to, to learn some good information. So for example, if I've got um, a video scroll, is going to basically tell me how deep someone scrolls into a video. Um, and I might want it to be a percentage, and I just represent that percentage as w zero to 100 or something like that. And so what I can do is I can have um, the, the name of this event be video scroll, and then normally what I want to do is I wanna ha I'll have the title of the video and an ID of the video. So if like YouTube, I might have it like YouTube colon and the YouTube hash ID for it. That way, if I ever need to, I can then run a report of all my videos on the website and get an average of how deep people are scrolling into them. An event that might trigger a goal would look something like this. A form gets submitted. We want to trigger the sales submission, so I put a plus, and I have goals that are set up to look for that sort of pattern, where it basically has the word um, sales submission with a plus at the end. And then what's kind of neat about this is because we didn't just do a regular goal as a URL, we can associate things like which form got submitted. Um, and you could actually pass another event that might be form view, and you can divide uh, the actual submissions by the views to get conversion ratios and things like that. That's why I like to put some sort of I identifier um, on the event so I can like compare those things later on. Um, and then like the social share, this one simply is going to be social share. We want to count this as utility value. And so I put an explanation point at the end. And so that way when I run my reports, I can later say, no, I want to, I want to do my reports where I'll total up all the goal values and any events that have an explanation point and contribute them back to whatever, whatever it is on the website that's driving that kind of value. So we've kind of looked at metrics. How, you know, the big thing, you know, the, the, the big takeaway from that is just need to look at measuring the things that define, interactions that define success on the website and ideally put values around it to weight how important these things are. And all the numbers in Google Analytics really fall into two categories. There are dimensions, or actually, any of the data in Google Analytics falls into two categories. There's dimensions and metrics. So we looked at metrics first. We're now going to look at dimensions. 
Um, and the way I like to kind of think of it is dimensions are, or the way I like to explain it, is sort of that dimensions are kind of like buckets. Um, and every time something happens, metrics are like putting a marble into that bucket. So let's say, for example, someone comes to the website and they start by going to blog A. Well, it's gonna put, we're going to put a session marble uh, in the bucket. We're going to put a page hit in the bucket. If next they go to another blog post, it'll now have a page hit go into that bucket. Um, if let's say they see a call to action for a ebook someone wants to download, um, then they could go to that offer, they submit the form, we hit the thank you, maybe they go to blog C and then they leave the website after that. And so, you know, these are dimensions and buckets. Now, if, you were, if we just had sort of that level zero analytics with no goal set up, um, this is what we'd have, but because we did set up a goal, the, our goal would have triggered here, and so let's say we valued uh, someone submitting that form as 25. What's neat about this is now we can actually attribute that value upstream. So we attribute that value to the page people came in on, so we could then look at, okay, let's look at all the different blog posts we have, which ones are creating the most value um, because of the way that value maps back. So um, what's neat is there's a ton of dimensions just available right out of the box with Google Analytics. The uh, content ones are pretty self-explanatory, pretty straightforward. It is kind of neat though that you can look at like sort of like just a, a in-session page path or a landing page, meaning this was the first page of a session. Also, you can look at traffic sources, um, which a lot of you know, people doing marketing are constantly looking at these. Um, and what's really neat is if you set up all your success metrics, you can do things like, I want to look at all the value organic searches delivering versus, say, PPC. Or if you're doing PPC, your keywords will be coming through and you can look at the value each keyword is producing. Um, and if you know what you're paying, you know, of course, you're going to know what you're paying for them. So then you can kind of start to calculate an ROI on those. Um, there's a lot of other segments. You can look at audiences. One of my favorite things to look at is devices. Um, even though we're all doing these responsive sites, a lot of times the usability and sort of the, the customer journey, um, kind of like the customer journey mapping gets a little lost sometimes, uh, particularly in the tablet sizes. And so a lot of times you can do things like, okay, I want to look at everyone who's looked at the website on mobile phones, tablet size, and desktop, and do I see a significant drop in value that one of these sizes is doing, I might need to be looking at some of my UX. The typical thing that happens is, you know, you might have a right column CTA, and in a mobile size, it drops down below the content, and people don't see it. Um, so it might not show up. So, you know, a lot of times, uh, that is a good way to identify some issues along those lines. But, uh, and there's a, there's a bunch of others. There's um, you know, some cool ones around page speed. So you can actually look at, okay, if my page loads in this amount of time, or if, I get, if it's this amount of time to get to first write, or to get to full render, or things like that, how much does my value drop off on my website? Um, and so it might be the argument for tuning some things up, maybe installing um, you know, responsive images, or lazy loading, um, things like that, moving to a different host, things along those lines. We start to understand some of those. And so like I said, it's fun to kind of just explore through all the different dimensions they have. Google Analytics has another really powerful system where we can define our own dimensions, called custom dimensions. And given that we have a CMS, we can pu push some things from the CMS over to Google Analytics and look at some pretty interesting um, types of breakdowns. So custom dimensions, basically, uh, you set them up in Google Analytics and you define a scope. It's either a hit scope, session, or visitor. I'll show some examples. Um, and so you define them in Google Analytics, but then you use JavaScript once again to send them over. And you get 20 of these per property, and they could be up to 150 characters long. So um, what I love to do is, so uh, out of the box, when we set up our success metrics, we know, for example, all the blog posts, how much value they're producing. But we might not necessarily know why. What is it about those blog posts that is producing that value? Maybe it's the way the author writes. Maybe it's the topic. You know, uh, maybe it's the, uh, the tone that we're using, a casual versus corporate tone or something like that. Well, we can push this data over into Google Analytics and then we can break it back. And so it might be, hey, I've got 14 blog posts that are written by this one author and 28 that are written by another author. And I can look at the total value of all of them, divide by the number of posts, and I can get a pretty good handle on who's writing better posts. Um, in fact, actually at our agency, we used that and it sort of gamified it between all of our developers who are supposed to write a couple posts every month. Um, and they all got pretty competitive about the business value. Suddenly their posts were, were delivering. Um, so those are fairly straightforward. Now, the next two are a little bit more advanced. I'll just say them for, um, just so you know what's possible. They're a little bit trickier to set up. 
Um, but visitor attributes, you could do things like, hey, if someone shares on our website, we might label them as a social share, and then we can segment out you know, what those types of people are doing. You can actually do things like um, count uh, what topics people are looking at and kind of figure out what topic is someone interested in, and then you can break that down by, okay, let's look at, say, people who are hunters versus people who are gatherers, you know, because they're looking at that type of content. What types of change in behavior are we seeing on our website? Um, you've got system status. So is someone a user? What user role are they? Um, are they a subscriber or something like that? And then you can ask for certain data in form fields. Um, someone's job role, um, psychographics, demographics, so forth. And all of that can be pushed as custom dimensions into Google Analytics. Um, session attributes are an interesting one. There's not a ton of, I, I find less use for them, but the few use cases I found for them are very powerful. Um, one, they could be used for um, sort of A-B multivariant testing. And so what I call concurrent split tests. And so even if you're using something like a visual web optimizer, um, I, what I like to do is even though what visual web optimizers might have a, a control and, an, and a, a uh, variant one, um, I want to push that data as a session, in, as a session variable into Google Analytics because they can do some deeper analysis with it. Um, and so that's all that really means is that you know, a, a concurrent split test is People come to the website and a certain percentage of people are shown one variant and other people are shown another variant. What's really powerful, and I think it's lost a lot, is what I call release testing. Release testing is basically a split test where the control is the way the website was in the prior version and then you release a new version and that's your now new version. And so if, you're, if, you, can, if you push that, hey, here's the version of our website we're on, you can then compare how did we do in version one versus version two or 1 .1, you know, versus 1.2 and so forth. Um, and what's, what's really neat about this is that um, you know, doing continuous integration is tough. Um, you know, when you get into like enterprise type sites and you're running things like BHAT tests and I mean maintaining all of that, like let's make sure the look of the site looks perfect, all this kind of stuff, it can get you know, pretty complex and it's pretty expensive to maintain. And I think it's really out of the budget of most like mid-size organizations. Um, but this is actually a good way that, hey, you launched the new website. Did we see a significant drop in our usability? It might be because we broke something. You know, maybe we, we updated a module and some, uh, one broke one of our forms or something like that. And so these are good smoke tests. And even if um, you know, the a product owner comes and says, oh, you guys, this, this color changed on our website or something like that, we well, you know what else to make the argument. Yeah, but we're not seeing any different difference in value. Um, that's being produced after we did that release, so it's not really having an impact. So we'll go ahead and, we'll go ahead and correct that. Um, one of the other things I like to do is uh, do responsive breakpoints. So, because Google doesn't know where your breakpoints are in your responsive themes, so you, know, you basically say, hey, if I've got a browser below this, then I want it to be ex uh, extra small, small, medium, so forth, and then you can break down your reports and maybe see if there's maybe certain breakpoints um, in our responsive design that might have some issues. So what do we do with all of this data? You know, we've got all these success metrics uh, measuring the important interactions on our website, and then we've extended, our we've extended our dimensions so we can segment down and look deeper into certain areas. What do we do with this information? Um, so I I've always kind of liked this idea, is that ult the ultimate goal is to drive this data to make sure the entire team or the entire organization is learning and getting smarter about how to do web development. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a book that came out several years called The Fifth Discipline that's basically about how you create learning organizations. So, um, and you know, the first thing is you've got to have smart people making good, you know, making good decisions. Um, you've got to have good mental models. So you know, it's the idea that you go to conferences, you learn, hey, this is the best way to do this design, or this is the best you know, kind of way to do UX, or this is the best marketing channel, or the best way to you know, do these different things. And that's always a good place to start. But what you need to do regularly is be challenging those mental models. Um, because they're not always the same across all, the, all, all kinds of different sites, and sometimes they just change. Um, and so we can use data to challenge our mental models and improve on them. You also want a shared vision. Um, this is one of the areas I think is interesting, is it, particularly if you can do a larger website where you've got the developers that are worried about things like technical debt and complexity, um, security, things along those lines. And you've got the UX people that looking to do trendy stuff sometimes and things that are interesting. You've got the usability people you know, that might be trying to make things simple, but sometimes you know, at the expense of emotional branding on the site. And so what I like about like, using data is to say, no, we're going to use this sort of ROI number, this utility value, and that's going to drive our decision making. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't care anymore about technical debt and those kinds of things, but now you've got something to weigh it against. Um, 
And then uh, team learning. And so that's where I think like having that number, having that number where people can see, hey, we just made these changes to the website. What kind of effect did it have? You know, and they'll learn, people start to pick up that, hey, these kinds of things are things we want to look for. But one of the biggest things we want to do is develop a, kind of a culture of systems thinking. And I'll show you a little bit of like how I like to think of a website. So to kind of think of a website as systems thinking is that we've got, um, we've got this website sort of like a black box. We can't observe exactly what people are doing on it, but what we can observe are inputs and outputs. Um, and in particular, what we want to see is what happens when we change an input, what does it do to our outputs? And so, you know, the typical way of building a website, you get your requirements, you've got your best practices and mental models, and your inputs, you know, can be creative features, um, people are coming to the website, content you're adding to the website, and then what we want to do is we can use Google Analytics with our goals, the built-in um, analytics and events to measure the output. Um, ideally, we can value them, so we've got sort of a single number to look at. One of the great things about a single number is it's something that most people can really understand. Instead of looking at a bunch of different types of metrics, if someone's a designer, someone's not necessarily a data-oriented person, um, you know, having that single number to look at is good. And then we've got to create this feedback loop. Um, so feedback loops. Uh, so we've talked pretty much all about the collection side of Google Analytics. There's the reporting side. So there's, you know, there's a lot of st a good stock reports in Google Analytics, but can get pretty bewildering. Um, generally, what I find is that there's maybe a two or three go-to reports. But beyond that, you're generally going to create a custom report. Um, so there's a way to kind of a quick way to create custom reports. It's an older way of doing it, but it's pretty powerful. And then there's the newer Data Studio, um, which is very powerful. You can bring data in from other sources and all kinds of interesting things, but it's got a learning curve to it. So um, a lot of times uh, I find it might just be easier to export and uh, you know, put it into um, Excel and put some things together. Um, and then there is a data API, um, which allows other systems to read this data. Uh, so, what I like to do is, you know, we've got to pick some inspection points. So I kind of look like, I kind of break down websites, like there's these websites that are just a project. Or someone says, we want to build this website and we want, to, we want it to be good for five years and then we'll redesign it five years from now. We're not going to do anything else to it. Um, and these people, some of these people really should be continually improving their website. They just don't realize it. They think the website should be a, a so what I like to do with these people is, let's figure out the important things to measure. Let's put this analytics set up on their website, and then let's go back to them in a quarter or six months. And let's just show them some of the data. And say, hey, here's an opportunity we might think for improving this. And, we think this. and it's interesting how many people have moved from thinking their site was just a project to realizing, no, there's actually a lot of things that we can do to improve the site using data. Then there's a second level site where it's like, okay, we're gonna basically build all the features we want in one sort of waterfall project. But we're going to do continual marketing. In particular, we're going to do content marketing. We're adding content. We're doing SEO, um, doing social engagement, things like that. And a lot of times, um, we find is there's going to be an editorial calendar planning. So you're planning your content and so forth. Or maybe there could be things like um, uh, content optimization meetings or things like that. That's a great time to bring that data in. Um, you know, particularly if you're doing good segmentation around those pages. Ideally, if you're on a big, pro, you know, big project where they say, no, we're continually going to be building this website. Um, ideally, in something like Scrum, bring the data to your backlog grooming and splint planning meetings. If you're not familiar with Scrum, those are just your planning meetings, basically, where you're saying, how, what is going to be the next important thing we're going to tackle? Um, and so, you know, if you're using a waterfall method, there's, anal there's analogies to it that's just kind of called different things. Um, and then one of the other things I actually really like to do is to bring this stuff into the, us the user interface of the CMS itself because that's where a lot of people live. Like I said, one of the coolest things I ever saw happen, it was kind of unintended, is um, when I deployed a system to help do this and it put a tab on everyone's blog posts where they could see a scorecard of the business value their blog posts were doing, suddenly they started self-organizing and gamifying around building better blog posts because they could see the data. Um, so adapting, um, I like to change that mentality of, hey, let's try to, you know, let's build this great feature to think of like, we think this feature is a hypothesis and we need to test it. And sometimes you test it using AB. Um, sometimes like, hey, this is, we think is so great, we're gonna just release it and then we can do the release style testing to test, did it really improve or not improve our website? Um, but it's just that mentality of when we make changes, we need to think of them as experiments, as hypotheses that need to be proven. Um, Regularly analyze to uncover value, and a lot of times it's going to be, hey, let's look at some bigger, bigger end reports, and then if we see something interesting happen, let's dig down and get down into our, our uh, dimensions to maybe figure out like why that's going on. 
Um, and then use the value, uh, that number, to, prior to focus a team and help them prioritize um, and be focused around one idea. So, um, so you know, this is a... This is kind of a concept that you know we would implement. Uh, we used to implement like in the two thousand late two thousands type time frame, um, and then eventually I'm like this is just this is a lot of work to do this manually. So I started a project, and I'm actually a Drupal developer originally. Um, so I was in Drupal back in like two thousand twelve, two thousand thirteen, and we actually had a lot of people ask us to port it to WordPress. So we did, um, and so basically we've kind of we basically built a system to help help these things happen. It's a plugin. Um, I was just going to show it to you guys real quick. If anyone wants to get involved in this project, um, you know, either just you know feedback. We've got, we've got a lot of backlog ideas on what we want to do, and it'd be good to have some direction on how people are using it. Or if you're actually a developer, um, you know, and want to get involved or document or anything like that, just show it kind of real quick. Um, so one of the first things we do is there's a whole API system for um, doing events. So like if there's another plugin or if you've got a theme and you want to track certain things, you can just hook into the system and whenever you install it, those, those events will start automatically happening in Google Analytics. Um, wanted to make it really easy to do things like set up goals. So we kind of created some interfaces where it'll automatically go from WordPress and you don't have to go into Google Analytics to set up the goal. It'll do it automatically from, uh, automatically from WordPress and then um, make it available as like drop downs so you can just set them on things like different form submissions, uh, maybe different types of link clicks, things along those lines. What's the name of your plugin? It's called Intelligence. Yep. It's, in, well, Intelligence WP, yeah. So that's the website, intelligencewp.com. It's just intelligence, you know, plug-in slash intelligence on, um, on uh, WordPress.org. Um, oh. Then um, wanted a way where it's sort of like, here's our scorecards, here's all the different events we think are important, and we can look at like, what are all the values we're gonna associate with all of these things. Um, and then allowing things like you can customize them at a form level and so forth. And then bringing the reports back into, uh, back into WordPress. And in particular, what we tried to do is get people away from vanity metrics of just hits and sticks and stuff like that and get them focused on value that's being delivered. Um, and kind of breaking that down into traffic value, um, sort of that micro conversions and macro conversion value. And then we do things like make it easy to compare different types of content. So you can say, oh, I want to compare just all the different blog posts and things like that because we're pushing all that stuff through. Um, again, doing something where like every, you know, authors can see a scorecard of the business value their content's generating um, just off their blog post. And then doing things like making it easy to dig down into segments. So like, for example, um, it's a little hard to read, but the top one, we're breaking, breaking uh, reports down by um, content types. This one's by authors, so we can see like which authors are delivering the most value. This one's like number number of words in an article um, for like what length of article is kind of optimal. This one's uh, the words are all blurry, but that one's all um, uh, topics, basically your category taxonomies and stuff like that. So, um, hope hope that was helpful. Um, that's what I got. If you guys got any questions? Uh, thanks for one. I'm going to follow up on it. But, um, yeah, I looked at Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. I set it up on everybody's site that I do, and then I go away. Yeah. I just want to have it there. So now I know a little bit more about when I go to the console. And I'm at. But you're talking about um, kind of custom dimensions. Mm -hmm. And you said that that's, are dimensions actually part of the and out of the box? So out of the box, there's a bunch of built-in dimensions. Oh yeah. Okay. So the question is, um, are dimensions a part of Google Analytics built into Google Analytics, right? So um, okay, the dimension concept is actually core to Google Analytics, and then it basically has um, it has ways of doing some stock ones. So a perfect example is going to be is there's a dimension called device, and device can be mobile, can be mobile, tablet, or desktop, um, and it'll automatically track those for you, right? But you can also have custom dimensions. So like one thing that Google Analytics doesn't know is what the breakpoints of your themes are. When I say breakpoints, like, you know, normally there's like say five breakpoints and you know you've got desktop and then down to mobile. So it doesn't know. So what you could use a custom dimension to do is to basically say, all right, for um, any viewport that's this size, I want to push, 
um, ex extra small. And for this viewport size, I want to push small, medium, large, and extra large, something like that. And so that way, um, that's, that's like basically a customized dimension that you created for custom information from your website. So things like pushing things like a blog author. Google Analytics doesn't understand what that is. It's not something that's built in, but you can create a custom dimension um, that might, that's author. And then you can push the author of your posts into that dimension. And now your report, you can start segmenting your reports down by authors. And that might require JavaScript to... It will, it will require JavaScript. Now, that's another thing, like if you use intelligence, it automatically handles all that stuff. So it'll automatically start pushing your authors and you can set taxonomies and all that stuff in the admin. So a lot of this is sort of like, how people didn't have to use JavaScript to do a lot of this kind of stuff, or even Tag Manager to do a lot of this kind of stuff. So if uh, we're going to use intelligence, we're still going into the Google Analytics console to set up those parameters? Or intelligence no, it'll set it all up automatically for you. Stop? Yeah. Please. Okay, uh, so you're a is asking if you use intelligence, do you still have to go into Google Analytics and set those things up? Not, not in the current versions. No, the, in the early days you did. Um, but yeah, no, the current version, when you first set it up, it'll go do all your custom dimensions for you. Um, and then it'll automatically start pushing all that extra data along. And so that was one of the big things. We just want to make it a lot easier so you're not having to jump back and forth between Google Analytics. You can set a lot of that stuff either up automatically or from in work. Because there is like an a API, a management API for Google Analytics. So it's just using the management API for Google Analytics to allow configuration out of um, uh, WordPress to, to make the changes to your Google Analytics account. Yeah. Um, if you use like Google campaign tracking with source, medium, on local links and stuff, mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, great question. So the question was, um, uh, so you can customize, for those who don't know what UTM parameters are, um, you can customize, like there's a, something called a campaign, which is not normally set, but if you, have a, if you control the link, you can put like a question mark, UTM underscore campaign, and you could say pass, hey, there's a PPC campaign, or this is like uh, our Christmas special campaign, or something like that, and then it will, yeah, it will, it will track all of that back to any of his... In the end, those UTM parameters are just dimensions. And so this stuff gets tracked back to all, all the dimensions. So just like value gets tracked back to medium and source, even though you're kind of custom implementing um, the campaign, it will track back to all of those. Yeah? Um, with the intelligence app, the plugin, how heavy is it on a website? And if you say, for example, take it off, take it off your website, mm -hmm. does it still keep everything in Google Analytics? Mm -hmm. So um, what it actually will do is it actually create, okay, yeah. Um, so the question is, if, um, how heavy is it? And um, does it, uh, if you remove it, would everything still be in Google Analytics? Um, so yes, in fact, one of the reasons we created it was because there's some really cool analytics you get out of marketing automation platforms like HubSpot or Marketo or Eloqua, stuff like that. But the problem is we had clients that kept changing platforms and they didn't want to lose their data. And so we're like, well, let's just you know, do like CTA tracking and stuff like that and let's move into Google Analytics. So that way, when we move platforms, we can keep that data. So the data is there. If you remove it, um, it'll, stop it'll stop tracking some of that stuff. Um, and, and actually the way it works is, if you already have Google Analytics on your website, it'll actually create a second Google Analytics account um, that's configured, because it configures things a special way. Um, so it won't mess up any of your current, any of your current configuration. Although if that current configuration is blank, you can do things like copy goals over and then track them in both. And, you can, and in Google Analytics, you can track like, into multiple um, Google Analytics tracking IDs. Um, and so then if you, if you uninstall it, your other Google Analytics is just tracking normal. The data will always stay there. I mean, you own the Google Analytics account. Um, but you know, the, the, the data going into it would stop if you, if you removed it. Um, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. You know, I try, so it's, it's actually a pretty direct port from a Drupal module. And, I mean, a lot of the code's the same. Um, I have not noticed a major slowdown, uh, or I haven't noticed a significant slowdown, but there, there's sometimes a little bit. Um, and the thing, like, and this is where a little bit of my lack in WordPress knowledge, like in Drupal, everything's cached. So if it, takes, if it takes, you know, 300 milliseconds more to build a page, it's no big deal because it's all going into cache and reverse proxy and, and so forth, um, which I'm assuming most WordPress is set up that way also. 
Um, and like when I host my WordPress sites, I do it on Pantheon. So their stuff's all set up to do the reverse proxy caching. So it doesn't really, you know, doesn't really make it, it doesn't really make any sort of impact. But most time it might add 150 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, something like that um, to a page load. Someone was asking um, for a link to your slides. Oh, um, yeah. You guys are recording this? All the videos are going to be uh, made available for free once they're yeah. complete. Uh, I don't know, but I think each instructor's option on how to share slides if they want. Okay. Do this. I normally post on SlideShare. Um, so I'm, I'm like SlideShare, Tom Dude, or something like that. Actually, I have my SlideShare up there. I don't. Um, I'll post it up to SlideShare. Um, if someone wants to, then just email me using the email address on there. Um, oh my gosh, I actually have like a really old email address on there. That'll still get to me. Um, um, yeah, I'll tweet it out when I, you know, when I do it, when I post it. Um, can I ask a question? Maybe really sure. stupid, but I'm kind of new to. I've got my website up, and um, at the very top, there's one line that says you need to configure your Google Analytics. Um, is that intelligent? Uh, that probably is, that's probably related to some plugin or theme you have. It's separate from this plugin. Right, I know it is. Okay. But I'm just, what I'm curious about is with that one line, mm -hmm. does that mean I should click on it and it's going to set it up for me? Or? Generally, no. Um, and so, you know, the. Okay, yeah, yeah. So the question is, um, if your website's telling you that you need to install Google Analytics, when you, if you click the link, will it set it up for you? Um, so you actually have to create at least one Google Analytics account because you've got to go through all the Google Analytics um, permissions and terms of use and all of that kind of stuff. There are some plugins, and Intelligence does this actually. Once you've created the first one, it then can create any, any extra ones after that. So the plugin might create an other one after that if you've already created a, a Google Analytics account. But yeah, you'll always have to create one because you, you, a plugin won't have permission to understand like where to create it otherwise. So you would create an account and then yeah. you could use Intelligence. <laughs> yeah, and probably like what that link would do is take you right to Google Analytics where you create the account. And it's a, it's a pretty, if you've already got a Google, um, profile, it's a pretty painless process to create a Google Analytics account. And it's not even bad if you don't have a profile, you just got to create the profile first, then the Analytics account. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, I have a few um, sites on the WordPress.com platform. Okay. And one main site, so this is a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the sites is a premium, and the other is a business, which comes to the new app, which comes to the part of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not familiar with Sorry, that. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I appreciate you, I appreciate you reminding me. So the question is on um, WordPress.com, um, uh, would you need to upgrade to premium to install it? From premium to business. Oh, from premium to business to install Google Analytics. Um, or can I just add Google Analytics to premium? You know, I'm not familiar enough with um, how WordPress.com is set up. Um, so I don't 100% know. It would probably be odd, though, that you couldn't add it some way, and there's so many different ways to do it. It might be, though, that there might, they might have some sort of field, and you can't use like their particular field. You might have to add it as a widget, you know, or something like that. Perhaps I can just look at adding it as a widget? Yeah, and I'm sure if you Google it, there'll be tons of people who have an answer for it, if there's a way to do it. Because um, that seems like something people write a lot about. But yeah, I don't know enough about the WordPress.com platform to, to tell you one way or the other. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can you consolidate and also multiple sites? Or would that have to be set up on the individual site and then do the monitor? Um, 
consolidate in the sense that you basically want to have multiple websites act as like a single property. Oh, and he's asking the question, um, can you consolidate the data from multiple sites? Um, and so, are, are, so you're saying like, maybe like a company has got five different websites and they want to track across all five of those websites? Different entry points and okay. <sighs> there is, okay, there is a way to do it depending on what you're trying to do. Um, the tricky part is this. Uh, Google's going to do all of its tracking through first party cookies, which have to be set by JavaScript on that domain. So as soon as you go to another, now if they're all subdomains, it's not a problem. Um, you can, there's a way to set what the cookie domain is, and if everything's set up as subdomains, you don't have to do anything special. Uh, you do one thing, you've got to go set the cookie value. In fact, actually, intelligence has a way that you can set it also. And you just say, don't set it at, at a subdomain level, set it at a domain level. And that way, the cookie will track people at all the subdomains. But if you're going to, um, if you've got multiple domains, um, the problem is the cookie will get lost when people go from one domain to the other. There is a way to correct for it. It's a little tricky though. Um, and um, I forget exactly, it's been a long time since I've done the process, but basically um, there's a special type of URL and you have to encode some extra things in the URLs that go from one site to another site. Um, and that way, that information is what allows Google Analytics to seam together the sessions across those. Um, there are some other sort of advanced techniques for doing that. There's kind of some ways to like use a, use a, um, uh, an iframe to kind of like maintain your sessions across, but it, it can get a little tricky. But like I said, the Google official way to do it is, um, they call it like cross-site tracking or something like that, but it does involve modifying your links going between those sites. I think we have time for one more. One or two or quick questions, so I'll hand here and hand here. Okay. Uh, just building off what you said, can you use Google uh, Data Studio to build reports? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're right. So I wouldn't put it all into the da same data set, but you could create. Re oh, the question was could you use um, Data Studio to pull together multiple sites? And, and yes, no, th thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. So, um, because it might not be a good idea to have it actually broken down into different data sets. But with Data Studio, you can bring multiple data sets, not even just Google Analytics. I mean, you can bring data from all kinds of different sources into it. And so yeah, you can easily say, I want you know, this report from this data set, this report from this data set, and this. So you can create like sort of like a universal dashboard or something like that for a client or what have you. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, everybody, this gentleman said his question was answered already. So please, we'd love your feedback. MyTalk.rocks. And let's give Tom a hand.